Um, so thanks for that introduction, Janice. Um, as she mentioned, I work in the IT department and I co-lead the digital transformation for Merck's vaccines business. It's a $7 billion business is growing at double digits. And when I came here on Monday, um, I believe I was in this room, but we held a digital transformation council and I came to a humbling realization. Um, there was a panel session and there was a poll out and they asked people, what are the obstacles in your company to success, successful digital transformation? And the common theme was the IT department. And so I represent that remark. And so, so what I'm hoping to show you today that actually we are part of the solution and maybe that's why I was put in the role to be part of the solution. Classic management philosophy, if you know you have an obstacle to success, put that guy in charge of it. Okay. So I chose, um, we have a lot of initiatives going on at Merck. I chose four to talk about today because they're a uh, high return on investment as well as high probability of success. So um, we'll, we'll talk about these four um, major elements in detail. The first is around product data management. And so Merck has, um, in a very fortunate position, we have our three top products are constrained by uh, supply, meaning we could sell more if we could make more. And so it puts a lot of pressure on the manufacturing department to keep up, not drop any lots, not discard any material, and to run all out. And so to help um, our uh, manufacturing department and facilities to run, in that manner, we've um, started an initiative around product data management. Um, it's really about manufacturing analytics, drawing all your sources of data into uh, the manufacturing data lake where then our process scientists and engineers can view all the data together and try to drive insights into root cause for problems that are happening in manufacturing as well as process optimization, increasing yield, increasing potencies in our vaccines. And uh, the sources of these data, they come from the shop floor. Um, previous speaker spoke about uh, data historian. We have that. We have a continuous historian. We have batch historian. We have uh, laboratory information management systems. We have manufacturing execution systems. All this data feeds into the common analytics platform um, and where the, the data is then organized. So the inputs on the left. It includes raw material data, as much supplier data as we can put in there, um, and not just the current data, but as much historical data um, as we can gather. And uh, what we hope to see out of it, um, the dashboarding. So again, the previous uh, presentation showed some really nice dashboards where um, the operations supervisors know where they are in the process and if it's trending or if it's tending to trend in the wrong direction. Advanced analytics for process engineers, scientists to look into, looking for um, yield optimization. Um, and a self-service export uh, ability so that um, those same, same scientists and engineers can get the data and, and put it in the format that they need to do their jobs. So why are we embarking on product data management? Um, Today, the current state is heavily Excel spreadsheet based and probably it's not too different from a lot of other companies. Um, exports from our data historian into Excel format. This is just very onerous for process scientists to try to do insights. So the idea of having the common analytics platform where all the data is, is, um, is put it's so um, if, if we run a batch of product, we have all the information from all the systems that have been electronic that collect information about that married with other systems. Right now it's very siloed data and it's hard for engineers to correlate a, labra uh, a lab potency result, for instance, with um, all the batch information that went into producing that information. So current state, uh, very manual data gathering intensive, and that's why we have um, a picture of the caveman trying to find all this data using Excel. Fast forward to the future, um, when this uh, data lake is in place, and uh, large elements already are in place. We're just making it more, um, 
um, product, not, not so centric on, pro, uh, on any one particular product, but we'll have the ability to add new products. And our priority is, again, the highest revenue producing ones first into the data lake uh, so we can start taking advantage of the analytics. And uh, the sources of the data include not just internal nodes, it's easier to gather the internal node data, but as well as working with our suppliers and partners um, and working out agreements where th th we respect their intellectual property, but they're feeding us data that may impact our process. Um, and so that data will also be fed in that big data lake. So another important initiative um, is our predictive condition monitoring program. And actually, this has been in place for eight years at uh, some of our larger sites. Um, we run a lot of rotating equipment, big pumps, motors, compressors. And we put vibration monitors, vibration sensors on the bearing mounts. And um, using these sensors and using um, analytics. We take the time series vibration um, from the sensors, convert it to the frequency domain, and if you examine certain um, peaks in frequency associated with um, certain modes of failure of your rotating equipment, you can predict over time when that, um, that compressor uh, is, is experiencing trouble. Uh, some of the common modes of failure include uh, bearings going bad, misalignment, and looking in the frequency domain at certain peaks, you can see um, when, when, when um, these failure modes are becoming apparent. These are longer time constants, so uh, we monitor over a period of weeks and months. Um, and as you can see, we, uh, we'll trend that over time. And when we detect a serious state, it'll start to go into an alert level. And from there, we actually have a closed loop process where um, our reliability engineers are monitoring these trends. And when it gets to a severe to moderate probability of failure, that's when we plan the downtime to uh, take the machine down, repair the problem, fix the bearings, align the shaft, and we can avoid catastrophic failure. So the whole idea is max uptime. We'll remember from the Tuesday keynote speaker, the gentleman from Thies and Krupp talked about max uptime of equipment. That's in line with what we're trying to do with predicted con condition monitoring to um, fix the equipment before it goes into catastrophic failure. Oh, Jeff, sure, go ahead. So if you could just hold that question, I'll, I'll make sure I get to it. Um, and actually, I'm kind of get, going to get into the answer. Um, there's a lot of domain knowledge that went into this, this analytics, OK? So our vibration analysts know what frequencies are associated with failure modes. So it's not one of these pure machine learning type algorithms that predicts it. It's domain knowledge. Um, plus some signal processing that gets us to the state. So um, I was at a GE talk, the breakfast talk, and I thought it was um, a pretty profound statement. Um, the gentleman said that domain expertise is at the core of any analytics program. And so in this case, for predictive condition monitoring, that is absolutely the case. And similarly, we also have steam trap monitoring. So steam traps. Um, help protect um, downstream equipment like steam turbines by removing the non-condensable gases that are in that stream. Um, they tend to have a high rate of failure. When they fail, they become large consumers of energy. So um, our, our steam traps, we also have, in this case, um, the steam traps are in pipe racks, geographically dispersed. 
um, and it's uh, most efficient to use wireless IoT sensors out in the field rather than have technicians going out there constantly checking them. And they feed back information. And again, domain expertise around certain signals and trends uh, from the steam trap monitors help predict when, when they're in failure mode or after, after the fact failure. Um, another major initiative, um, we already have a lot of um, um, technologies in place in the processing world. Um, in pharmaceutical manufacturing, the laboratory results that help us release the product is equally as important. And only now are we embarking on a program to bring uh, uh, more digital into the laboratories. Um, one, one pilot we're doing is around what we call digital methods execution, it's really just manufacturing execution systems in the laboratories. So trying to get away from paper-based um, um, electronic uh, work instruction to electronic work instruction. Um, we're also introducing finite scheduling planning, resource planning in, in the lab space. Um, I'll just go through these quickly. Specification management, chemical inventory management, um, calibration management, um, uh, done rather through paper, but via software, um, integrated training. Um, lab analytics, this is important. So we, um, assays are used to release our, our products. So they might be protein assays, they may be potency assays. And um, as we um, try to maintain a stable product, uh, a, bi a biopharmaceutical product, we also have these lab assays associated with them. And sometimes you don't know if it's the manufacturing process that's drifting or whether it's actually your lab assays that are drifting. So by getting more lab data, feeding that into our uh, analytics platform, we'll have a better, our engineers and scientists will have a better way to assess whether it's manufacturing drift or laboratory drift that's causing um, our products to go out of specification. Okay. Um, and the final initiative I'll be talking about is open standards. Um, it's what I call, or our, us IT guys call our stealth digital strategy because we typically don't talk to our business partners and uh, manufacturing leaders about open standards because their eyes tend to glaze over. Uh, but I'm happy to have this audience who, which can understand and appreciate it. So our CIO is a big proponent of standards. Um, he believes that um, by deploying and engaging and adopting more standards, we're driving productivity into the organization. So any standards bodies, standards organizations, which can help further Merck's interests, we, we need to be a part of. And just here's just a sampling of them. Um, Merck is a founding member of the Open Process Automation Forum. They're meeting right, right down the hallway. My digital twin is actually in that room, participating in that forum. Um, and the analog on the laboratory side is this allotrope foundation. Uh, same idea except for lab automation, uh, standard protocols, standard taxonomies. Um, so that's, that's another initiative the company's involved with. And then we have so, a lot of industry groups we participate in, Bioforum, uh, PDA, and ISPE. Um, and, and these groups also help develop standards. I'll talk about one important initiative very closely aligned with open process automation and Namor in Germany. It's a collaboration with the Bioforum where we work with um, its end users, its system integrators, its equipment vendors, all working together to um, develop a standard interface between intelligent equipment, which comes with uh, their own intelligent controls, and our supervisory distributed control system, and simplifying the exchange of information between them via standard data communication protocol, standard data model. So working with the Bioforum, uh, we're trying to establish uh, uh, interoperability via standard interface. Um, we, our plants operate with a supervisory control system, but the uh, equipment, uh, the, uh, the unit operations we use in biopharmaceuticals, so these are bioreactors, chromatography systems, filtration systems, they all come with their own control systems that run the local equipment. And in the past, we would get involved in writing custom interfaces, um, and it'd be time consuming and they would break easily once you upgrade one system. So to get around that, we came together um, 
as the entire industry. So again, the equipment suppliers, the integrators, and the end users on establishing a common communication protocol we would all use, OPC, Unified Architecture, as well as data information models, all the things you want to know about your bioreactor, both in terms of control, as well as feeding the analytics platform so we can get, get the process insights. And so um, our, our initial ambition is to um, get three common unit operations in this interoperable mode, the bioreactor, filtration skid, and uh, chromatography uh, column, with the idea that uh, from your uh, DCS system, um, in the S88 framework, you would kick off phases and, and the equipment phases would run in your uh, unit operation, but be controlled by a supervisory control system. Even if you have disparate systems uh, and from, from different vendors, we would allow this communication. And um, with the advent of some of the really nice protocols we have now that are able to carry information models like an OPC UA, um, th this came about just recently. So how do you promote adoption and faster um, acceptance of um, a, a new interface, you hold a plug fest. And um, so we invited uh, some of our uh, DCS vendors to participate as well as um, our equipment suppliers. Um, we ran a plug fest last November. It was hosted by a neutral facilitator, a system integrator. And we invited Emerson, Siemens, and Rockwell to come and they brought um, a batch engine, they brought their um, DCS system. And then we had some of our um, equipment vendors, Paul, Millipore, and Sartorius also come, and they brought their, uh, just their controller for, they didn't bring the, the hardware. Uh, we were just trying to prove out the soft simulation. And using the standard interface and, and, and the in-development um, information model, we were just trying to do a proof of concept. So we were uh, doing a very simple unit operation. But in that three-day workshop, um, all the different permutations, so Emerson's gonna talk with those three, and then the Siemens DCS will talk with those three. We got eight out of the nine to communicate, and then that, that last um, pairing uh, worked a little bit later. So proved out the concept, and we're hosting a second plug fest uh, later this month in Massachusetts to um, try to further progress the idea. So key to making this work, again, having the communication protocol that can, that can do this, as well as the end users getting together and trying to figure out, okay, what do I wanna put in the data models? So why this is so much better than before, every, every interface previously was <laughs> just like a, a custom interface, right? Um, one of our, in one of our factories, that engineer would work with the equipment vendor and they would say, well, I need this, I need this, I need this. And it would be a five to eight week effort. So by doing this work together as an industry and agreeing on the common information model, you know, that five to eight week custom development becomes a one to two day effort. So that's, uh, so that's how standards, a, a good example of how standards are driving productivity. And uh, so we're working on the bioreactor right now. Our, our next steps, um, unit operations for normal flow filtration, chromatography, and we're gonna go through all the common unit operations. So we'll have this library. And we're already starting to talk to some standards organization. Once we develop this, we want it maintained, sustained, and that's where some standards organization comes in. Okay, so final thoughts. Um, it's been emphasized several times and by many speakers, but you have to, to, for digital transformation to work, you have to create a digital culture. And it really helps if there's a tone at the top. So our CIO has an ambitious goal for digital, $1 billion in cost savings. And then he looks at each of his presidents of his divisions and he signed manufacturing 500 million of it. And, and so it flows down. And then it's also helpful to, actually create like a digital strategy office. So that's what was done um, at Merck. So you want people full time advocating for these things, um, sending the cultural messages, tracking the value, um, encouraging um, experiments in digital. So um, I think it was Mike Goldfile in his Tuesday keynote address talked about this 
crawl before you walk before you run spectrum. And, um, and, and we have uh, something similar. We call it minimum viable products. So previously um, at our company, it was all about big projects and you staff it up with people and it's a program and it's like building the Hoover Dam, you know, <laughs> big project oriented uh, mentality. And we're shifting now towards one where uh, smaller groups can quickly get some capital, um, institute a culture where it's, you know, Failure is okay. You can try out experiments, and if it doesn't work, that's okay. It's only failure if you didn't learn from your lessons. So, and aiming for minimum viable products rather than big projects where you have to stand up lots of hardware and software and applications, and which takes years. We're looking for experiments, the crawl piece, uh, minimum viable products that can be executed in a relatively short time frame, small number of resources, smaller money. Um, the other thought is around architecture, and you've heard me talk a lot about standards. So we wanna set up, for instance, the IoT architecture in a way that promotes the openness. Um, so uh, I know I talked to a lot of people who want to work with Merck in the um, IoT space, and my, um, my advice to those, if you wanna work with us, make sure you come with an open architecture mentality. I wanna be able to insert technology in and out very quickly. We have so many good uh, vendors who wanna sell us these new IoT sensors, that's great, but it's gotta work you know, in a standards-based hierarchy. Um, ISA uh, 100 wireless, um, that suite of standards, we want that adoption. So again, if you wanna to talk to me about um, uh, new wireless architecture and IoT, you better be prepared to tell me how you're subscribing to standards so that we can quickly do technology refresh. We're not interested in a closed system architecture. And, um, and we talked about standards as well. So the fifth bullet that's missing that's an important thought is uh, make sure your IT department is not the obstacle to your success in your digital journey. And hopefully I've been able to convince you that at Merck that's not the case. So thank you for, for your time.